Shankar. I am the lead system administrator or senior system administrator or data center guru or every time I'm introduced to people I'm given a different title so I'm not really sure what I am anymore. But uh, I work here at the University for Information Technology and Services. Um, I'm here to give you a bit of a guest lecture. Um, uh, you guys had submitted some questions and the online people had submitted some questions. This is, of course, a systems analysis class. Um, and I'm a system administrator, so there's a little bit of difference there. So um, I'm not really going to directly address the questions that you sent me necessarily. But if any questions come up at any time, feel free to let me know, ask questions, ask lots of questions, it's fine. Um, I'm pretty bad about going off track and coming back on track, so if I, if I talk about something and start getting off track and you're curious, make me get back on track. Or if there's something off track you're curious about, let's chat about it. But um, so one of the first things is, um, ooh, I think I skipped one of my slides. What is a system administrator? And honestly, when it comes to seeing job titles at different companies and applying for jobs and things, you got to be careful because it means different things to different people. It really kind of depends on where you are. Um, here at the university, the system administrators are the people who manage the data center and the servers and things like that. But there's some organizations where they'll have that level be data architects and blah, 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 you know, all these other wacky titles. And the system administrators are the people who take care of people's desktops. They administer the systems on the desktops. And so depending on what you're looking for, where you're at, and what your life goals are, that's a very difficult title. <laughs> so do your research on that one. Because if you want a job like mine and you apply for another place that uses it, more as a help desk kind of job. You might be disappointed with you know, what, what opportunities you're given. Um, so what do I do? Um, I manage the data centers for the university, that is plural. Um, we do at this point have two actual data centers and then we have server infrastructure at two other campuses besides that. Three other campuses besides that. Um, so I don't know how much Lily has run into this, but every spring, the university has a big inventory thing. We have to account for all of our inventory on campus. Anything with those little, like on the back of the TVs, you can see the little white tags that have state. I have equipment in Shreveport, Natchitoches, two different places in Alexandria and Louisville that I have to account for, that I'm personally responsible for. So, yay! <laughs> um, I manage the accounts for the university, and I'll talk a little more in depth about that in a bit. Um, I integrate a lot of the services that the university uses. Um, I plan and implement new projects, systems, and services, and I support the support staff of the university. And that will make a little more sense in a bit, too. So, uh, as far as the data center goes, I've only got like five or six slides. We'll probably just rush through them and we'll just start chatting. But like I said, if you've got questions now, feel free. You know, let me know. But. Uh, so one of the things I do is I manage and maintain our compute. When you get to a data center type level these days, things are really kind of all split up, right? Back in the day, if you had a server, you bought a computer that was a server, and it had hard drives in it, and it had processors in it, and it had RAM in it, and all that. That still exists, but in a data center like ours, we now have that split up a little bit. So up here, this is a picture this is actually the servers that run pretty much everything you use. <laughs> These are literally them. Um, and so our compute are what you would think of as the tra traditional computers, which have the RAM and the CPUs in them. The hard drives in them, though, are just enough to boot them up and get them running. The storage is actually off somewhere else. And the reason for that is it's an economy of scale thing. So I also manage and maintain the storage for the university. Um, and so those, those different storage units and the pools and how they all work together. Um, so we actually, we utilize a combination of what's called hybrid storage and uh, flash storage. And so the hybrid storage has normal hard drives like everybody's used to. I mean, most people nowadays, you, you guys are all familiar with flash drives, right? And SSD drives and all of that. Um, so because of cost, the last time we got production storage, and production being the servers that we're using every day. So the Moodle servers, the banner servers, uh, what's some other stuff I might run into that we have on there. 
Those are the big ones. I mean, you guys use Moodle every day. You may or may not know it, but you use Banner every day. <laughs> um, <laughs> but those are all running on that storage. And it's what's called a hybrid array, where the data is stored on spinning hard drives. But spinning hard drives are really fast, right? I mean, we've got a big pool of them. We've got three boxes full of hard drives that have all that storage in there. But then there's also SSDs to act as a caching layer. So any data that comes in or out, theoretically, has been stored on those SSDs. So it's coming faster on and off. And then on top of that, there's a RAM layer where it stores a bunch of that in RAM, too, so it can deliver it even faster. Um, in the future, some of you may have heard or ran across this already. We are starting to deploy what's called virtual desktops. So if you haven't seen this, um, there's a website you can go to, or you will soon be able to go to and log into. When you log in there, you'll get a Windows 10 desktop in your browser that'll have the university software installed in it ready to go already. And that runs on a system that is 100% flash. So it's all SSDs, and then on top of those SSDs, we have that RAM layer too. And the way the system manages everything, I can have, literally, I can have 2,000 desktops but because all of the data on those desktops are the same as each other, on disk it's only stored once. And so it's able to hold that whole thing in mind. So I can support thousands of people simultaneously using different desktops off of that storage faster than the storage in your local computer. So, cool stuff, <laughs> right? Um, I also manage and maintain um, the, what's called the virtual infrastructure for the university. Uh, hopefully at this point in your lives you guys have heard of virtual machines and virtualization. Nods, shakes, things like that. Um, where you might run across it day by day is there's software you can put on your computer. Let's say you've got a Windows computer and you want to play with Linux, right? You can put software on your computer, VirtualBox is one, VMware, uh, Workstation is another where you can create a whole new computer inside your computer without reformatting your computer and having to reboot and all that. It's a virtual computer running on your computer. Pretty much everything we do at the data center level is virtual. We still have some physical stuff for either redundancy or for um, special tasks that have certain huge requirements like our backup system the amount of storage the backup system requires. We don't use our production storage because of how expensive it is. So we have a physical server with its own attached storage for cost savings. Same thing, you see the security cameras around campus. Because of the amount of storage that that system requires, we have that non-virtualized, so it's not using our production storage. So it's very expensive, right? Um, but I manage and maintain spinning up all those virtual machines, all those... Uh, servers it runs on. If we go back up, so in this picture here, it's a little bit old because there's actually a, another blade there now, but all those little green lights, those are blades that are currently running. We have the production servers for the university, we have around 150 of them. And so like Moodle, uh, the, the Moodle that you guys connect to has two. There's a database and a web server, right? Banner has dozens. Uh, we have some other things for Moodle for the faculty and staff, and those are split across, and we've got file shares and things to integrate with email and all that kind of stuff. All of that runs on the first five blades. So over 150 servers are running on five actual physical servers. And everything for, uh, or I'm sorry, the databases for Banner run on two of them. And then we have two for what's called unified communications, which is all the telephone and instant messaging and uh, a lot of the teleconferencing stuff and video. If you've been in any of the classes that do the video stuff. Um, and then we added one to do video bridging. That's what the new one is for. Um, but that's, that kind of tells you what level of virtualization has gotten to. Um, in the data center, it's now rare to have a standalone server. Almost everything <coughs> is completely virtualized. because. Quite frankly, you know, the hardware has gotten advanced enough, the, the RAM is fast enough, you can put enough RAM in one of these things. Um, and the storage, especially when you have a storage system like ours, is so fast. If you only ran Moodle on one of these, 
that surfer would be so underutilized, you know, would be sitting there bored all the time not doing anything compared to what it was capable of. Uh, another example of that is these two bottom blades here. Those are what we bought for the VDI. Between those blades, we can support between 500 and 1,000 simultaneous desktops on two computers. And part of that is just because, you know, CPUs have gotten that advanced. There's so many cores and so much CPU power available. The other thing is we can put a bunch of RAM in there. So each of those has 512 gig of RAM. Right? So most of you, your computers have 4, 8, or 16. We have 512 per blade for the, that virtual desktop. That's how we can support that many simultaneous people on the system. Can I add something? I mean, I, nothing, I mean, I think it just builds on what you're, you're saying. We were um, in the process of trying to figure out um, a grant. We had received a grant the, the CIS department had. And uh, or we were preparing to to get the grant together, and we were writing out the specs of what we were interested in in purchasing with the grant. And I think that we'd actually looked at you know a server. And um, whenever we contacted Information Systems, I think we contacted Tracy Brown over there just to get his feedback. He he basically told us, "Do you need that?" Basically, because. We have, you know, we're actually scaling back to save money so that we don't have to store all these extra devices um, because we can use what we already have. And so I think that kind of adds to what, what you're saying in that, you know, these things, they, they can hold a lot more than, you know, we need. And so it, instead of purchasing more devices and having to run and set those up and maintain them over time, um, we, you have to look at it differently. So I just thought I'd add that. Yeah, and, and, a lot, and things have gotten really cool but complicated at the same time. So like when you're looking at storage systems now, our storage system is made by a company called Teshop. It still is a little bit unique in the industry. All these people have all these storage systems with different features. The Teshop does something called deduplication. And some other systems technically have it, but they do it in a different way. But anytime you store any data on that storage system, before it writes it to disk, it says, wait a minute, do I already have that data? And if it does, it just points to it again, and it doesn't save it again. So our 150 servers, probably 100 to 120 of those are all Windows Server. And on a Windows Server install, the minimum you're going to get is between 3 and 4 gig on the disk. And of that, 2.5 to 3 gig of that is all the same between all the servers. So with those 150 or 100 to 120 servers that we have on that storage, that data is only being stored once, right? So we can be storing, that's kind of what that picture alludes to up there with the, with the little green donuts. So this is actually from last year, so the data is not up to date. But that first donut shows, okay, we're, we're storing, I think that says, let's say 34 or 24. It says, uh, I think it's... Let's say it says 30. The second one says, well, after we compress the data, it's closer to 17. And then the third one says, well, after we dedupe it, it's closer to 13. Right? So we're storing all this data on disk. As far as the servers know, we've got 20 to 30 terabytes on disk. We're only actually using 17 terabytes of disk. Right? And so that's one way that, excuse me, that's one way that the university is working to maximize I said this type of storage is expensive, um, and that's true, but we were able to scale back how much storage we had to buy because of features like this, right? Because we actually only need about half of the space that we utilize, right? I think I said that a little backwards. We're, we're only storing half of the space that we need, and so we were able to get a smaller system, and so that system, uh, you know, it costs us less because we can scale it back. Um, but then it also lasts us longer, right? So had we bought a system that had 30 terabytes of storage and didn't do dedupe per compression, at this point we'd be going back saying, okay, now we need to expand if we need more money, right? Whereas this system should last us easily three to five years, which is the typical lifespan of something in a data center. Um, after five years, getting maintenance for support and things like that starts to cost enough that you pretty much just buy something new. Um, because the manufacturers, they don't want to keep the parts around and stuff like that. And when you have things like Banner and Moodle running on things, you have those under support. Um, we, um, depending on the vendor, um, we either, with anything of ours that's Dell, 
we have a support contract that, let's say a drive fails at 1 a.m., they have four hours to get us another one. Okay? With the Tejile, they gave me a small box of parts, and if anything fails, I can immediately swap it out, and then they have one business day to get us a replacement for my, for my parts kit. So, I also literally, I, I don't think I got there yet, but I have one of those jobs that's 24-7. I could be asleep in bed, and at 2 a.m. I might get a text message that says, this disc died, and it's my job to come in and deal with it, and make sure that there's absolutely no downtime whenever possible. How often does that happen? <sighs> it happens. <laughs> um, I would say it averages out probably to once or twice a month. And of course, some of that's really packed in. I'll have like four or five incidents that happen in one month, and I'll have like two months where I don't have to deal with any of that kind of stuff. But, you know, like I said, I have equipment in Louisville and Shreveport. So we had an incident come up a few weeks back where we had a drive fail in Louisville. And we started looking around for our spare drives. And it turns out all of our spare drives for that unit were in Shreveport. Wow. So I had to get up first thing in the morning, drive to Shreveport, <laughs> grab some spare drives, and then drive from Shreveport to Leesville to swap the discs out and start rebuilding to drive back here. Uh, to, you know, do everything else I'm supposed to do throughout the day. Um, <laughs> so, uh, the other thing I do is I manage accounts. And this is literally, no joke here, this script is the script that creates all your accounts as students. Okay? I actually wrote this. When we switched from um, our previous system to Banner, we had to redo how all of that worked. Because the old system was based on, um, it wasn't database driven. And it used to create these, these files that then a Visual Basic script would go and mangle and do all this stuff with. Tell them more about scripts. I've alluded to them in class, but did you have it on the screen? Um, yeah, scripting, if you're going to do something like I do, scripting is very, very important. Um, <clears throat> real basically, I mean, scripting is, is really simple programming. Okay? Um, if any of you have taken a programming class, uh, you know, in a typical programming workflow, you write some code and you compile it, and that makes a, a like a dot .exe or whatever that you can run. Um, scripting is more real time. It's usually a text file, and then the system just runs it in, in the background, compiles it on the fly if it has to, or just runs the command. Um, you know, back in the day on Windows, you used uh, batch scripts, which was just a list of run these commands in this order. Um, if you're using like Linux and Mac stuff, you can use bash scripting, which is in the, the terminal. And that's very similar to that batch. There's some actual programming stuff in there if you want it to be, but for the most part, it's do this command, then do this command, then do this command. Um, nowadays, on the Windows management, we're using something called PowerShell. If you have Windows 7 or newer, you've got it on your system. You can play with it. Um, but, I mean, the whole point of the scripting is to automate tasks that you do over and over and over. Um, in the industry, they say if you have to do anything at least three times, you should script it, right? And so we have every semester anywhere between eight and 10,000 students actively enrolled, right? None of us are sitting down going, okay, let's get the list of students and make sure all their accounts are up to date. It, it, we, we don't have the staff to do it. It would take me months at best. I would lose my mind probably and go jump off a bridge. Luckily, all the bridges count are very short. I would probably survive. But, <laughs> um, so we have scripts like this. That This script at the beginning, when it runs, it connects to Banner and says, give me a list of all the students. right? And uh, there's a, I don't think I'm high enough up in the script, but there's a SQL query up there that it passes to the database. And then it comes back through, and it starts saying, okay, uh, check if that account already exists. If it does, let's just update this information. If it doesn't, let's put all this information together and create the account and apply a password to it. Uh, and then it goes through and it says, okay, what type of student are you if you're a full student student versus someone who's graduated versus someone who's applied versus a BIPC student versus this or that. Um, it puts you into different security groups in the directory system that give you access to different things. And so we have a security group that drives whether or not you can get on Wi-Fi whether or not you can log into Moodle, whether or not you can log into the portal, whether or not you have email access, all of that. And so this script does all that. And so it actually it runs several times a day. Um, twice a day it gets the full list of students and it makes sure everything is all up to date. So um, 
uh, and also every hour, it says to the database, you know what, give me only things that have, only people who have changed in the last two hours. And so if you go to the registrar's office and decide to change your name, <coughs> within two hours, that will be reflected in the system. Okay? Or if an applicant to the university gets um, accepted and they uh, register for classes, Within an hour or two, they'll have their access to Moodle turned on, their access to Wi-Fi turned on, and the system will be set up to give them a license in Office 365 for their email. Office 365 is a little more complicated, so it takes another <laughs> day or two sometimes to get that all in place. But uh, yeah, that's all things we script. Another thing that we script is on the faculty side, uh, you know, we'll get a lot of uh, faculty who maybe their password is expired, maybe they're having another issue they can't log in. Um, so I have a little script. If someone calls me and says, I'm having trouble, I can run this command with their username and it spits me out a bunch of details right on the fly. Is their account expired? Is their password expired? When does their password expire? When was the last time that their password was changed? Uh, how many times have they incorrectly authenticated? Things like that. So we can look at it and say, oh, there's a big red text that says password expired. Their password's expired. Let's fix that. So I have another script that I can run with their username that resets their password. Or for you guys, you know, if you call the student help desk and they need to reset your password, there's a script that is um, controlled by a web front end that they can pull up, where they can put in your CWID number. It pulls up your picture from your ID, your name, your CWID, and your date of birth, so they can verify that you are who you say you are. And they can click a button and it runs one of those scripts on the back end that resets your password. Okay. Uh, and so we've got all kinds of things. We have a new faculty hire. We have a script that can create the account for them and stuff like that. We have to go through and manually touch a few things on those. But yeah, any, anything, anything, anytime I sit down, I'm like, there's a lot of steps to this, and I hate it, and I have to do it multiple times a day. I am probably going to write a, a script to not have to do that anymore. Um, and so... Here we go. We create and maintain retire the accounts for faculty staff. We write the scripts to manage the student accounts. And then we integrate um, our system here is called Active Directory. It's Microsoft system for <coughs> accounts and passwords and storing things like office numbers and phone numbers. Like if you go to Office 365 and you have an email from Ms. Ferris back there and you click on her icon, it might bring up a thing that has a phone number for her and an office location. You know, that's all driven by Active Directory. Um, and then uh, we manage the policies. So, you know, you guys are able to log into certain computers and not other ones. And depending on where you're logged in, you might have access to different resources. There's a system on the back end called Group Policy that drives all that. And we're the, we're the gatekeepers of that as well. Um, and then we integrate all of the services. So these are a lot of the services that we use. Um, Active Directory is our on-campus directory. Um, Cisco WebEx, some of you have probably ran into WebEx in classes or whatnot. Uh, that's a video meeting service. It's actually hosted in the cloud, but we have it set up so that with your university username and password, you can authenticate to it. And so there's a bunch of stuff that we set up in the background to make that work. Uh, Moodle, you know, Moodle's a basic software package to open source that you get. We've done integrations with it so it talks to Banner and talks to Active Directory. So once again, one username and password, you log in. Every time you log in, it checks what classes you're supposed to be in and make sure your enrollments are right because it's talking to Banner all the time. Um, OrgSync, we've integrated with them. Campus EAI uh, is the company that hosts the portal, mind.nsula.edu. Uh, you know, we, we make sure that as best we can, the iOS and Android devices work on our Wi-Fi and with our services. Sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse. <laughs> I can tell you I'm really, really not happy with Google over Android because um, for years and years and years they haven't supported certain features with Office 365 that's just at this point being lazy on their part. We don't know why. Um, but on an iOS device you can go in and just type your email address and password and it sets up all your email and on an Android device it won't. You have to go through some extra steps. And it was submitted as a bug five years ago at this point. And they just haven't done anything about it. Um, and then some other things we do, you know, we have big projects. We help investigate and plan, do testing. Uh, and then if we end up doing the project, we actually do the 
deployment of the project or the implementation. Uh, and then you guys, normally when you have an issue, you talk to the student help desk. Faculty and staff talk to what is now called the TAC, the Technical Ass uh, Assistance Center. It used to be the help desk. Um, we have a network team. We have a team that does all the banner stuff. And then we have a bunch of different users with their own applications on our systems. And I support all those people. <laughs> so normally, someone like you is having a problem, you, you don't talk to me. You talk to someone at the help desk. Or, you know, when, when Miss Lily calls in, she calls the TAC and talks to someone there. If it's a problem they can't resolve, they contact me and say, we can't figure out what's going on with this. We can't resolve this. What can you do? Which usually sends me down a rabbit hole of investigation of why something's not working. Um, but that's that's kind of how that workflow works. Um, so that's that's all the slides I have and, and all the meandering I have. So what are your questions? I have one related to uh, what you were saying earlier about the storage being cut down so much. Do you have to put anything on tape? Uh, we do. Um, Every, every semester, at the end of the semester, we take certain high-priority things. Moodle is one of them. I believe Banner is still one of them. And we dump those to tape for historical purposes. It's kind of gotten to a point where, with some of that stuff, if the data is more than about 24 to 48 hours old, it's not good anymore. And so our primary backup solution is actually a system called Veeam. And it runs on a, a standalone server with hard drives. And um, since everything's virtualized, so back in the old days when you had to back up something, whether you were using tape or drives or something else, you would get this agent, you'd put it on the computer, and you'd say, I want to back up this file and this file and this file. And if that server blew up, back in the day it was uh, Blackboard instead of Moodle, right? And so they would back up all the user data in Moodle and the database. And if something happened to that server, they'd have to either get a new server or they'd have to wipe that server reinstall Windows, configure everything, install the application, put the data back on, point everything to make sure it was all talking to each other. It was about a two-day process. Okay? With Veeam, <laughs> Veeam talks directly to our virtualization system. Where we use a company called VMware. They have a product called vCenter that manages kind of all that. Veeam goes to vCenter and says, hey, take a snapshot of that server. And that takes about a second. Right? creates a new file, anything new written to the servers, written into that new file, the old file is left static. So then Veeam goes, hey, mount a copy of that file on this other machine as a drive, and then we'll back that up however long it takes. And the machine that's running, the machine being backed up, has no idea it's being backed up. And any changes it's making don't affect that backup. When it took that snapshot, that's, that's frozen in that moment in time. And so we can do cool things with that, like say, all right, restore this whole machine, and it'll go into vCenter and it'll create space and redeploy that machine. Or if you have a quick and dirty issue, it'll just create a copy of that machine right on its own storage and make it show up in the virtualization system. And it's slower because it's running on the Veeam storage instead of our production storage. But depending on what you're doing, that's not a big deal. So like uh, yesterday we started a process. We wanted to make some archives of some old Moodle courses to come off the production Moodle system. That's exactly what we did. We said, instant restore this VM. And within five minutes, we had a copy of the Moodle web server and the Moodle database server running off the Veeam storage in our virtual system. And so we just had to reconfigure them to talk to each other. And then we can start that process. So that's a very good question. But yes, we do dump to tape. Um, Primarily at the end of every semester, it's the Moodle stuff, because that's what's most likely. Someone might come in for whatever reason three years later and say, we want a copy of this course from this semester. Um, and just in case our current backup doesn't have enough retention or it's not still in the Moodle system, we'll have something on tape. We haven't had to restore one of those. And we've tested it a few times to make sure it still works. Because a backup you haven't tested is not a backup, by the way. <laughs> you haven't ran across that yet. Um, but we, I started this job in January of 2013, and we have not had to have an actual restore from a tape for somebody in that entire time. Um, in addition to some of that, uh, we also, um, our storage system, we have a duplicate of it up in Shreveport, and every night, it takes a snapshot and sends a copy of all the current data up to Shreveport. So 
while right now it would be a bit of a hairy process, to today, let's say 10 minutes from now, a meteor hits this campus. And we're wiped out. Right? Theoretically, if someone was knew it was coming and ran off campus really quick, they could bring Moodle and Banner back up to running in Shreveport within a couple of days with uh, a snapshot of data from 6 p.m. last night. Now, we hope nothing like that ever happens, obviously. And as we go forward, we want to automate that process and set some of that stuff up better. Um, so the idea is some, sometime within the next couple of years, we'll be at a point where if a bad, realistically, like if a bad storm came through, the city had the power wiped out, and they were telling us, oh, it's going to be at least two weeks before we can get power back. A team of us could go to Shreveport, and within probably a few hours, we'd have Moodle and Banner back up and running. And it wouldn't be as spunky as it is coming from here, but uh, it would be up and available for uh, off-campus students. Or Shreveport students that maybe weren't as affected, or you know, international students, things like that. I mean, obviously, anybody in town who didn't have power, they either have to leave town, or you know. But is this a typical setup for universities in the state? Are we, you know? What are your um, thoughts? Yes, um, there was a big push for that sort of thing after Katrina, because <laughs> obviously a lot of universities lost visibility during the whole Katrina kerfuffle. Um, and so that's becoming a bigger and bigger thing. Uh, when the state auditors come through, that's something they want to see is for you to have a DR plan. Different people have implemented it in slightly different ways. Um, we're somewhat lucky in that we have multiple campuses that are far enough apart that it kind of makes sense. Um, one thing we're seeing, we actually, uh, a group of us went to Ruston on Tuesday to have a meeting with a bunch of the other university uh, technical information technology type staff. And uh, a number of the universities are doing co-location agreements with tech. And so they'll go and put some of their own servers in the data center at tech, and then tech will put some of their equipment at their data center. And that's one way that they're implementing that. We had a discussion with um, LSU Health Science Center up in Shreveport to do something similar, uh, where they would put a rack in our data center, we would put a rack in their data center. Um, some of that kind of fell apart because you guys may or may not know there's a lot of political issues going on with LSU Health Science Center right now um, due to privatization and some of the stuff the state has done. And so they've got bigger fish to fry right now than trying to deal with us on a co-location agreement. Um, also for you the guys that don't know, the state of Louisiana has a thing called Lonnie. How many of you here of you have heard of Lonnie? Okay. Lonnie, L-O-N-I, is the Louisiana Optical Network Initiative. And so all the universities in the state are connected by line, right? And so in our data center, we have a connection to the North Lonnie connection and the South Lonnie connection. Technically, that's all 10 gig, right? So when you talk about computers and things like that, you know, you have 100 meg, 10 meg network connections, 10 gig network connections. Um, we connect to Lonnie right now at 1 gig, but there's 10 gig in our data center. So when we're ready to make that upgrade, and I think we're really close on that. Actually, they may have already switched over and just not told them. <laughs> but we, we will be able to, in the very, very near future, connect to Lonnie at 10 gig. Um, and so like LSU Health Science Center, Lonnie is there. And so if we had another data center there, we would have, at the minimum, a one gigabyte direct connection there. That we're not, you know, we don't have to pay AT&T or Suddenlink or something like that to go across the internet and pay for all that bandwidth that way, right? And so that's why a lot of the universities are like doing a co-location with tech or with some of these other, because all the universities in the state, their networks are all connected at super high speed to each other, right? There's also a few other, there's a place called Venue, and they, they do data centers. They have a data center up in Bossier City. They've got one down in Baton Rouge. They've got one over in Mississippi. They've now connected also to Lonnie. So if you want to pay a corporation to manage your data recovery or, uh, you know, your duplicate, um, data center and stuff like that, they're also high speed connected to Lonnie now. And so you get a high performance benefit from that. Come on, questions. I know you got them. You submitted them online. You definitely <laughs> have them. <laughs> well, while they're looking up those questions, tell us how you got. Well, go for it. A, 
a system analyst or a system administration? Because I've got to be honest with you, if you, if you want to be a system analyst, I'm probably not the best person to ask for advice how to do that. <laughs> so system administration, um, number one, be very, very willing to learn. Because not a day goes by that I don't have to learn something new. Okay. Um, the other thing is you know, learn some scripting things and learn the basics of how a lot of the stuff works. Um, pretty much no matter where you are, if you're doing system administration, you're going to have to do administration of Windows desktops. So you have to have some level of knowledge, hopefully better than your average person on the street, right? Of, of Especially things like policies. You know, how, how does authentication work on the Windows box? How are those permissions driven? You know, what kind of policies might you want to apply or not apply? Um, you know, what are the ramifications if you give the end user admin access to a workstation? What's the ramifications of that? If you take away their admin access, what's the ramifications of that? You know, and, and how do you work around those different ramifications and things as you do that? Um, Definitely have a, a good concept of networking, um, how networks work, um, you know, how to interconnect things, um, virtualization technology, have, have a good conceptual grasp of that. And honestly, a job like mine is one you usually kind of work your way up to. Not many people get a degree and become a system administrator. <laughs> that's, that's kind of a rare occurrence. Usually you start at some kind of other technical and you develop your skill set up enough where you can kind of step up into the position. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of my yes. In system administration, how often do you have to deal with security problems? Problems or security in general? Because security in general is always at the forefront, right? Because that's 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 one of our jobs is to maintain, make sure the systems are running and up, and security is part of that. You know, if the systems aren't secure. If someone can get in there, they can mess up your system, and they can take them down. So, I mean, that's that's, a, that's one of my primary functions is to make sure that the systems are secure. Um, you know, we've done some different things as far as that goes. We've uh, actually just this year we've implemented what's called a DMZ. So our network is now way more complicated, <laughs> unfortunately, but that there's a security benefit from that. So um, when you hear you, you guys. Have, watch movies, right, where someone's hacking it, they've got past three of our eight firewalls. Um, that's kind of what they're referring to. Now, no one has eight firewalls. That's an absolutely ridiculous concept. That, that's something they make up for movies. But in a DMZ, so is everybody here familiar with a firewall, right? Firewall basically stops unwanted traffic from getting into something. Uh, so like Northwestern, we have a big firewall between us and the Internet. So if someone on the internet randomly tries to connect to that workstation, they can't get to it because the firewall won't let, let it happen, right? And so in the past, when things were simpler, what you would do is in your firewall, you would say, okay, we have a server like Moodle. So we will let web traffic come through into the server. Well, that server is on a network with all these other servers that may not have public access, right? And so if something was to occur where that server got compromised security-wise, it would be a jumping off point to other things inside our network, right? So with the DMZ, what you do is you set up two firewalls, and your Moodle web server you put in between. And so you say, people from the outside can come in via web services through this first firewall, and they can get to that Moodle web server. And then the second firewall controls, well, what can that Moodle web server talk to on our network? So we then go back and say, okay, well, the Moodle web server, it can talk to the database server at this address on these network ports. And it can talk to the directory system at this address and this address on these network ports. So if it tries to make a remote desktop type connection, an SSH type connection to the database server, it's literally not allowed. It can only talk to that server on the, the database port, right? And so that's, that's an example of one thing. Now, that makes things infinitely more complicated. Because before we could set up those two servers, get them to talk to each other, set up that outside access. Well, now we set up that outside access, and we have to set up inside access. And so it, there's a lot more complication of things. But it makes the system significantly more secure. Um, along with that, you know, we have to implement the policies for when people change passwords, how complex their passwords are. Um, if someone's account gets compromised, we have to try to catch it. Uh, and, and work with them to make sure that gets resolved. Um, one of the ways that happens is um, 
you know, all of our email goes through Office 365. 365 actually has a um, automated system that can detect if somebody's sending spam messages, right? And so about twice a year we'll get an email saying this account in your tenant has been disabled because they were sending unusual messages. And so we have to find out who that user is, <laughs> which is usually pretty easy because we have their email address. And we have to find out what happened. And usually it's someone who either used a weak password or put their password in somewhere they weren't supposed to. And somebody, in, and this is actually not an exaggeration, both times it happened this year, somebody in Nigeria was using their account to log in and send messages. So you always hear about how bad Nigeria is. In our experience, it actually has been traffic coming from Nigeria. Um, in another case, we had issues where um, one of our websites was failing. No one could load this one website. And then they had a form on the website. They started emailing them all this junk information. They couldn't understand what it was. Well, we finally narrowed down. There was a range of IP addresses out of Russia that found the script and, and or, or found the, the form and found how to write a script to just post a bunch of junk to the form hoping that it would end up public somewhere or it would become spam messages for somewhere, you know, whatever they do. So on the network, we had to go and we had to block that IP range through the firewall and not allow them to connect to us at all. So we kind of network-wise nuked part of Russia this year. Um, we haven't had any negative... Right problems. around the election yeah. time, I'm bet. <laughs> <laughs> it was way before election Okay, time. that's good. <laughs> that was back in the spring that that happened. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's a big concern for us. You know, from time to time, as much as we have put policies in place and Office 365 does, you still get those email messages that are like, oh, you have to upgrade your webmail account and, you know, click on this uh, link and blah, 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 blah. Whenever we see one of those, we put new rules on the mail filters to block future ones that are similar to that. And then on our firewall, we block that link. And so anyone on campus clicking on that link will just get nothing. They'll get an error in their web browser. Unfortunately, that doesn't help people off campus, <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it's, what, it's, it's what we can do to, to resolve it. And honestly, after just going to Office 365 and implementing some of the policies we have, that type of email has dropped so significantly. We used to get dozens a day of those sorts of things, and now we get dozens a year. And so that's, that's a pretty significant change. Um, and some of that's due just to better mail filtering because since we're using Office 365, they're not just filtering mail based on the analytics of our email. You know, they've got millions of customers and billions of accounts. And all, you know, different people are marketing things as junk or clutter or whatever. And, you know, they're seeing all these different viruses come through. And, they, you know, their, their analysts have gotten pretty good at catching all that because they, they see so much traffic and they can analyze so much. So uh, with all this... Uh with those experience in uh, finding viruses and stuff, is there a way to uh, to find out if a system has been compromised before anything really bad happens? Um, there are some ways to do it. Um, it. Unfortunately, that's one of those places that the best solutions for doing it are very expensive. Um, you know, one, one easy way is just to watch for unusual traffic patterns. If, if a server is suddenly using, you know, if a server throughout the last three or four weeks has been using one to two megabytes of bandwidth and suddenly it's using 30 to 40 constantly, something's wrong there. You know, um, you, you can see some other signs too. Um, some companies do make solutions. You can put software and it will monitor, you know, hey, this file never gets accessed, and now it was. It was by this account that usually doesn't log into the server. It can throw you an alert, but those things are very expensive. We haven't implemented anything quite like that yet. Um, but, uh, and, and it's gotten so, I mean, back in the day when people would hack systems, it was pretty obvious. People would hack into a system like a Moodle or a website, and they would deface it, right, because it was fun, or it was crazy, or maybe there was some political agenda behind it, or some other agenda behind it. Nowadays, most of the time, people hack into systems. There's two reasons. Number one, they either want to send spam. Because the more spam you can send, the more likely someone will click on it. You can either steal their information or sell them a product. Right? Or it's uh, people like, like ISIS, tal Taliban, trying to send surreptitious information. And so they like to bounce from server to server to hide where they're coming from. Um, none of our services right now are old enough to have the exploits that they use for those sorts of things, we hope. Uh, but 
couple years back, we did get a visit from the FBI because some of our older servers had information on there. They weren't specific what it was about. But, I mean, through the subtext, you could find out that they thought somebody had used us as one of the bounces at one point. All those servers, by the time they got to us, were offline, though, and blocked. So there wasn't much we could do to help them in that case. But um, that sort of thing does come up. Who knew? Hey. <laughs> Any other questions? I know you got them. Yes? You are talking about some of the teams that you support, like the network team. Like, how many people, just a range, how many people are on those teams? <laughs> you know, that's a funny question because when we talk to other um, organizations in the state and we tell them the size of our teams, they're shocked that we actually get anything done. So, um, currently, the system administration team is me. Um, <laughs> there, there are two positions. Do y'all see the cape kind of flying in the back there? <laughs> um, there are two positions, and uh, the second one, uh, there was some reorganization a few weeks back, and so my other system administrator is now the lead over the TAC, the, the Technical Assistance Center for Faculty and Staff, and he took some of the system administration duties with him, but not all of them. But we were actually later today supposed to do uh, an interview process with some candidates for the other position, but we had some timing things come up, so that's been pushed off until next week. But we are looking to hire a second system administrator. Um, our networking team has one network engineer. Um, our uh, telephony team is one guy. But the two of them that... So telephones nowadays are pretty much network devices, right? Um, unfortunately, the, the phone system we have across campus right now is kind of an older system, so it really is a dedicated phone system. But we're going to, in the future, start rolling out newer phones, and they use a system called VOIP. Or VoIP, and that's the phones are IP devices. They're little computers, and they connect to a special server, and all of the phone calls are just traffic on the network. And so those they work very closely together. Um, so that's really kind of two. And we're talking about when we hire the new system administrator, we're hoping to get somebody with some good networking experience, so that we'll have a better bridge there. Because um, when it comes to some of this data center stuff, I do do a lot of networking stuff, but not campus wide networking. So it's just within the data center, right? But I, there's there's a lot of in-depth networking stuff I have to at least be aware of conceptually and a little bit of practice so that when we're communicating these things, we're talking the same language. <laughs> um, and then the, the TAC currently has three full-time people. So we have the lead and we have two full-time, what used to be help desk people. But uh, that's one of the departments where we have a lot of student workers. So currently we have, I think, four student workers. Um, and so that has helped there. But we'll have people come in and say, all right, well, who are, who's your security team? And it's like, well, I guess we're the security team because we're, we're the teams, you know. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go and have meetings with people and we'll, we'll describe, you know, all the different projects that we're working on and the things we implement and things like that. Well, how many system administrators do you have? We have two. And they're like, what do you mean two? How do, how do you do that? We do it. <laughs> Any other questions? Tell them how you got where you are. I like the story, so you have to tell it. So, uh, oh boy. So uh, when I was in college, so my actual degree, prepare to be amazed, my actual degree, I have a BFA in theater with an emphasis in sound design. So I went to college for sound design, doing theater, opera, and dance, and I did a lot of jobs running sound systems. Uh, I have, I tell people this all the time, they don't believe me, but it's true, I've probably forgotten working with more world famous artists than most people will see in their lives. Um, I have done concerts with, actually I turned down Robbie Shankar, uh, let's see, uh, Twinkie Smith, or no, what's her name, uh, Twinkie, ah, see, now, I, I forgot them no all, <laughs> but both the uh, Marsalises, I've done both Marsalises, Phil Glass, um, the woman who was Hot Lips on MASH, can't remember her name now, um, uh, Leslie Nielsen right before he died, mm -hmm. actually. One of only two signatures I've ever gotten from people in my life is Leslie Nielsen and Douglas Adams. Um, those of you who aren't big readers won't know who Douglas is. Well, you know what? There's a new TV show based on his, his stuff, so you guys might know who Douglas Adams is. Um, actually, I got his signature literally two months before he died. But anyway. Wow, don't ask for my signature. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anybody want to die? Um, <laughs> Woo. 
no. Anyway, um, so sound design, I was going to school in the 90s, and that was when it was the computerization for sound technology was really taking off. And so I kind of became known as the guy who could make your computer run sound stuff. Back in the day, it was very Macintosh driven. Um, it, a lot of it was based around older Pro Tools systems and their previous system sound designer. And so there was a lot of stuff in you know, getting the right control panels and extensions. And I, I could become a master of that. So I'd have studios call me up and come in and tweak their computers so the Pro Tools would run right. Well, in doing that, you know, I got some computer experience or whatnot. And, um, so a few years after that, I made a terrible decision to take a sales job. Uh, there are people who are great at sales, and I am not them. Uh, and after leaving that, I decided, you know what, I'm sick of the arts. 